there's a lot to discuss right now and in the news um recently more information came out about the uh the benghazi scandal um there were memos that were released by our government that showed that barack obama knew that benghazi was a terrorist attack within a few minutes that uh, leon panetta and a few others went up and briefed obama about the terrorist attack they did not brief Obama about a YouTube video. See, a YouTube video was a lie. See, that was a lie that the White House perpetuated to cover up the fact that it was a terrorist attack. And the reason they did this is because uh, under George Bush, um, there was not a single terrorist attack on American soil after 9-11. Not one. Terrorist attacks were prevented for years and years, you know, under the Bush administration. And then Obama becomes president, and this Benghazi thing happens. And Benghazi was a terrorist attack on American soil that happened on Obama's watch. So Obama had to cover up the fact that it was a terrorist attack. And the way he did that is he blamed it on, on, it. He blamed it on a YouTube video, and he told the country that it was protesters that were uh, protesting against the United States at Benghazi that had uh, stormed the uh, embassy and, and killed uh, Christopher Stevens and, and some of our, our soldiers. Um, but that was a lie. Um, it wasn't a, a spontaneous protest. It was a orchestrated terrorist attack. And um, documents from our government were just released that showed that Barack Obama knew that it was a terrorist attack within minutes of uh, that of that attack starting. So minutes after the attack on Benghazi started, Obama knew that it was a terrorist attack. Um, Leon Panetta and some other people briefed the president and told him about the terrorist attack. So. The White House lied. Obama lied through the campaign to uh, protect his his, uh, his butt. <laughs> I don't know if there's really a, a better way of, of saying it. But there's, there's also another document about Benghazi that came out uh, within the last week. Um, the Senate produced a, uh, a report that uh, basically said that Benghazi was preventable that it didn't have to happen, that the government was warned that a terrorist attack could happen in Benghazi, and uh, we didn't prevent it. We didn't beef up security. Um, our, our government ignored those warnings. You know, the Obama administration ignored those warnings, and there was a terrorist attack um, at our consulate in, in Benghazi, and Americans died. Um, it's a big scandal. It's been going on for months. Um, we're starting to get some answers, but uh, not everything has been answered yet. And uh, they need to keep pushing for, for more information and, and uh, continue the investigation into that scandal. Now, also, as we all know, um, yesterday was Martin Luther King Day. Um, it's a great holiday. Um, it became a holiday in the 1980s. Ronald Reagan made it a, a national holiday um, that we would commemorate Martin Luther King every year. And uh, Martin Luther King did a lot of great things for this country. Um, we've all heard his uh, I Have a Dream speech. And... Uh, a lot of uh, freedoms and, and liberties were, were brought to African Americans because of the, uh, the hard work and the sacrifice that, that Martin Luther King made. Um, Martin Luther King died for this country. Um, he was murdered. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it, it should be forgotten that, that uh, the guy who murdered Martin Luther King was a Democrat. Um, <laughs> but again, that's what's just what Martin Luther King did for this country was so honorable 
and uh, he sat. He was, you know, he sacrificed himself for our nation. He died for our nation, and he's a hero. He's somebody that we should look up to and and honor forever. And uh, I actually want to show you guys a video about about Martin Luther King here. Five score years ago, great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as the great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. I have a dream. My four little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. This will be the day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning by country tears of peace. We land of liberty of the Beyonce. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims cry, from every mountainside. I'm Dr. Alveda King, niece of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I greet you today, and I just want to share with you a little bit about my family and my history. My uncle, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., during his lifetime, was a Republican, as was my father, his brother, Reverend A.D. King, and my grandfather, Dr. Martin Luther King, Sr. The Republican Party, historically, has supported the rights of the oppressed. During the times of slavery, many of the abolitionists were Republicans. Today, we have another issue that is affecting the lives and freedom of many of Americans. Those are the little babies, the preborn. And so as the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., I want to encourage you today to remember the rights of all people, from the womb to the tomb. Dr. King said, injustice anywhere, is a threat to justice everywhere. Dr. King also said that the Negro cannot win if he's willing to sacrifice the futures of his children for immediate per personal comfort and safety. And so today I encourage you, as you make very important decisions on whom you will vote for, to remember to vote for your values and vote for life, liberty, and justice. Let freedom ring, and if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. Well, uh, so we learned from that video that, that uh, Martin Luther King was a Republican. And uh, that was uh, one of Martin Luther King's family members that was telling us that information. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that Martin Luther King was a Republican. Um, that is, a, that is a information that just most Americans don't know. And uh, I think because they don't know that information, that myths have gone on for years about conservatives and the Republican Party. Republicans are, are constantly uh, accused of being racists and bigots and homophobes, but people forget that it was the Republican Party that fought discrimination. It was the Republican Party that freed the blacks. Abraham Lincoln freed the blacks. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, you know, and uh, Republicans also made it so blacks could vote. And uh, every every single uh, I'm trying to think of the word civil rights uh, legislation, all the civil rights legislation that has ever been enacted in this country was passed by a majority of Republicans mostly Republicans. Um, the Civil Rights Act in the 50s, you know, 
came to uh, came to us through President Eisenhower, who was a Republican, who was a Republican, and even in the '60s, the Civil Rights Act that that uh, happened there that was passed in the Congress by Republicans. See, if it wasn't for the Republicans, the 1960s Civil Rights Act that uh, President Johnson signed into law, if it wasn't for Republicans, that civil rights legislation would have never happened. That law would have never happened. See, Lyndon Johnson, he was the lone Democrat that, su that supported the Civil Rights Act. Uh, LBJ actually went against his own party on that. He joined with Republicans in passing the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s. Isn't that amazing? A lot of people don't know that. But yet it's the Republicans that are accused of being the, the bigoted racists that they truly are. It's a lie. It's not true. There's a lot of myths about the Republican Party. And uh, the next video I want to show you is a video that is uh, it's basically debunking the myths about conservatives and Republicans. So I'm going to show you guys that video right now. Welcome back to the firewall. Well, election season is upon us again, and so I thought I'd provide a <laughs> voter's guide to the Republican Party to help make your decision just a little bit easier. Now, obviously, the one thing that everyone knows about we Republicans is that we're evil. But evil is a little too generic. There's no way to really separate the evil Republicans from the evil corporations that pay pretty much everybody's paycheck, or even the evil military that protects our freedoms and our right to be evil in the first place. So you have to be a little more specific. And the best way to do that is to use a Venn diagram. Now, the first thing that makes Republicans uniquely evil, at least the Democrats in the news media, is that we're greedy. Second, obviously, we're all fascists, and most importantly, of course, we're all racists. So, just to clarify things for you before you vote, let's start with greedy. According to Democrats, we Republicans are greedy because we're in favor of low taxes and limited government. We think you should surrender as little of your freedom to the government as possible, and you should be entitled to keep as much of your money as you possibly can. We think you're entitled to the rewards of your own work. We also think you know how to spend your own money better than the government who wants to take as much of it as possible. So, as you can clearly see, we Republicans who don't want your money are greedy, and the people that do want to take all of your money, the Democrats, are benign and generous. Just ask. Secondly, we evil Republicans are all fascists. That's why students on college campuses never let us speak without throwing pies or chanting or screaming at us. According to those young Democrats, fascists are not allowed to speak and must be silenced by force in the name of freedom of expression. The word fascist, by the way, comes from the Latin word fascis, which means a bundle of sticks. It was used by a determined member of the Italian Socialist Party named Benito Mussolini as his metaphor for what he wanted for Italy. All of the individual sticks, which could be broken one by one, tied together into a huge socialist bundle, which could not be broken. Fascists believe in political violence to achieve their ends. Hey, just like the Occupy Wall Street people. Fascists are totally opposed to free market capitalism. Hey, just like the Occupy Wall Street people. They hate religion too, by the way. Instead, fascists believe in a powerful state-regulated economy which can bring just buckets of hope and change to the people of Italy or America. And the only private businesses that they approve of are ones under the direct control of, or at least dependent on, the government, like General Motors, let's say, or Solyndra. But if we're not fascists, at least we Republicans are still Nazis, right? As it turns out, the word Nazi is a German acronym meaning National Socialische Deutsche Apparatei Party, or NS. DAP. Translated directly into English, Nazi means, no wait, hold on, that can't be right. It means National Socialist German Workers' Party. But what do you know? Turns out you can't spell Nazi without Socialist Workers' Party. Isn't that interesting? No. We, anti-socialist, free market, private property loving, pro-individuality Republicans, are the opposite of both the big state government-controlled bundle of sticks that Italian socialists called fascists 
and also the racial socialists called Nazis, and even the international socialists called communists. You know, the guys in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Those socialists, plus the Chinese socialists, have killed about, oh, I don't know, maybe 150 million people so far. I know it's all very confusing, but no doubt Michael Moore will clarify it all in his next $30 million movie about how bad capitalism is. And finally, of course, we Republicans are racist. Now to prove it, let's go back to history again. Our Republican Party was founded in 1854 by anti-slavery, I guess they, they must have been anti-slavery racists, who departed the Whig Party and opposed the pro-slavery Democrats. The first presidential candidate for the Republicans was John C. Fremont, known as the Pathfinder. The Democrats went into full fear-mongering mode on this guy and said to the people, hey, if you elect a Republican, slavery is all but over. Well, Fremont lost, but in 1860, the second Republican candidate, Abraham Lincoln, did win. Between the date of his election and his inauguration on Monday, March 4th, 1861, seven of the slave states in the Deep South had left the Union to form the Confederacy, left it before he was even sworn in as president, because they knew that the rise of us racist Republicans meant the end of slavery in America, and it did too. After the war ended, Lincoln was assassinated by Democratic activist John Wilkes Booth, and then the racist Republicans passed the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, the 14th, providing due process and equal protection under the law, and the 15th Amendment, providing voting rights to blacks. The non-racist Democrats fought all of these things tooth and nail, and when the first black men were elected to Congress as racists, sorry, as Republicans, the Democrats got to work and founded the Ku Klux Klan to make sure it wouldn't happen again for a century. Democrats wrote the odious Jim Crow laws that kept blacks in position of slavery. All of those pictures that you've seen in the 1960s of, of people turning fire hoses and dogs on peaceful black marchers were unleashed by Democrats like Lester Maddox, Bill Connor, and George Wallace. You know, the great anti-slavery writer Frederick Douglass, also a racist Republican, once wrote, I recognize the Republican Party as the sheet anchor of the colored man's political hopes in the arc of his safety, the arc of his safety. Now, of course, Democrats can't argue with this history, mostly because it's true, although that's not usually stopped them before. So, what they say to justify this century of shame is that right around the time that they themselves, modern Democrats, came along, the parties mysteriously switched sides. Now, what really happened was that the loving, decent, progressive racism that's been a hallmark of the Democratic Party took a new and subtle form. They invented a new way to keep black people on the plantation, working for them like they used to. They gave them free food, free housing, and free medical care in exchange not for a harvest of cotton, but rather a steady annual bumper crop of votes. And the way that they did this was by telling black Americans that the Republicans that had fought and died for their freedom were in fact the real racists because we were against these new shackles like affirmative action and entitlement programs that keep them perpetually bound to their democratic masters. It's true, we are against them. We're against affirmative action because we see people as individuals, not as a bunch of sticks, good and bad individuals. And we don't see black people as being so inferior as to need lower test scores to get into college. We think they can do just as well or as poorly as anyone else. We so-called racist Republicans not only quote, but we actually believe the words of that great Republican who said that he had a dream that his four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. We believe that there is a word for people who are used by other people and provided in return with free food, free housing, and free medical care, and that word is slaves. And the Republican Party was, is, and always will be the party that frees the slaves. And if you want to be part of the team that's freeing the culture, go to declarationentertainment.com and become a citizen producer today. So there you have it, you know, all kinds of myths that about the Republican Party have been uh, debunked, uh, so to speak. Um, one of the myths I'd like to focus on that he mentioned is this idea that that uh, Republicans are Nazis. You know, I, I actually had a school teacher that taught that. 
he said, uh, if you go too far to the right, if you get too conservative, you get Nazis. And if you get too liberal, if you go too far to the left, you get Stalin, you get socialism. That's basically what he said. Uh, the conservative extreme is Hitler, and the liberal extreme is socialism. That was basically what my school teacher was teaching. But the party didn't get is that there's nothing conservative about Hitler. If you go too far to the right, if you get too conservative, like way, way, way out there to the right, you'll get anarchy. You're not going to get Hitler. Hitler was a big government guy. He was all about government control and government power. He was a dictator. Um, and dictators, you know, that's, that's like the centralization of government power. And you're dictating to the masses because you, all the power belongs to the government and to the head of the government. That's what Hitler was. And uh, the Nazi party was a socialist party. The name of the Nazi party was the National Socialist uh, Workers Party. It was a socialist party. And we all know that socialism belongs on the liberal, you know, left side of the spectrum. Um, so there's nothing conservative about Hitler. I mean, Hitler took people's guns away. That's right. Hitler enacted gun control. Um, so there's nothing right wing or conservative about Hitler. Uh, that is a myth. Um, like I said, the Nazi Party, and like that guy said, it was the uh, it was a socialist party. It's it's in their name. <laughs> um, so let's cut the crap and acknowledge that the Nazis were socialists. That is true and accurate history. Um, now there is one more video I would like to show you guys. Once I disclosed that I was Republican and the paper picked it up is when I started receiving uh, hate mail from Democrats and people that told me that I was a sellout and that it was the tradition of black people to be Democrat. Up until that time, I didn't really think much about it. The Republican Party has either not told a story well or a story has been hidden and contained by the liberal media. Uh, there would be no Voting Rights Act if it hadn't been for Republican Senate and House members. Okay, they would, they would not be the legislation we have today. It was Republicans mm -hmm. who stood up for that stuff. Uh, the Democrats were the racists back in those days. They, it was the Democratic South, mm -hmm. and those Democratic governors were the racists. But again, you know, history has been kind of rewritten. The Republican Party in Texas was started on the 4th of July, 1867, in Houston, Texas, by 150 blacks and 20 whites. It was that way across the South. The Republican parties were started in the South by African Americans. In the state of Texas, two of our first three statewide Republican chairmen were African American. Uh, the first 42 black legislators elected in Texas were all Republican. The first 112 black legislators elected in Mississippi were all Republican. The first 190 black legislators elected in South Carolina were all Republican. The first 41 in, in, in Georgia, the first 127 in Louisiana. So now you've got all these African Americans really stepping up and starting to gain political standing, political power. Now, you have Democrats on the other side who have been very racist. It's in their platforms. They support the Dred Scott decision. They think the fugitive slave law is great. Uh, they started a nation to keep slavery alive very racist and so now they're facing a situation where that these these blacks are now their rulers are now in office are now u.s senators are now u.s how do you stop that 1866 democrats themselves started the ku klux klan its purpose was not to kill blacks its purpose was to take control and return democrats to power their their stated purpose in the kkk was to stop republicans and restore democratic control now 
If you're looking for a Republican that you want to take care of, you, you can wipe out any black you want because they're 100% Republicans at that point in time. You can't wipe out any white. I mean, some whites might be Democrats. You've got to be a little more judicious when you're wiping out whites. So what happens is the Ku Klux Klan starts attacking, not blacks, Republican conventions. For example, in New Orleans, in the Republican convention in Louisiana, the Klan joined with the New Orleans police, joined with the New Orleans mayor, Democrats. They attacked physically at the convention in New Orleans, Republican convention. They killed 40 blacks, killed 20 whites, they wounded 150 others. 1868, they put out a push card in South Carolina and it listed what they called the radical members of the South Carolina legislature. That push card's about the size of a baseball card. It was put up by the Klan. Klan put it out. It had the, the pictures of 63 legislators that needed to be wiped out in South Carolina. 50 of those legislators were black, 13 were white. Now, they were all 63 Republican. On the back of the card, it gave you the name of each legislator so you'd know who you're trying to kill. Congress starts these hearings in this group called the Klan. And they have hearings, and, and so they bring in Democrat leaders that under oath from these Democrat states said, yes, the Klan belongs to our party. It, it's actually in Congress. 1872, the hearings, it's a 13-volume set of hearings in Congress. Unequivocally, Democrats say the Klan is ours and belongs to us. It's there to restore Democrat control in the southern states. Those guys who lived through it made it very clear. For example, one of the early black congressmen was John Roy Lynch. Another early black congressman was Richard Kane. And they're having to fight the Klan physically for their own safety. They, they go armed to Congress because of the Klan attacks. These guys said, if we as blacks would simply stop voting the Republican ticket, if we would agree to vote the straight Democrat ticket, all the violence against us would be stopped. Uh, in 1964, um, incidentally, the year that three of our civil rights workers were killed in Mississippi registering blacks to vote uh, was also the year that civil rights legislation, historic civil rights legislation, was being promoted and President Johnson wanted to sign it, but nevertheless it was held up, bottled up in the United States Senate by Southern Democrats. And one Democrat in particular who was the last individual to try to obstruct this legislation was a guy named Senator Robert Bird of West Virginia, who for 14 hours and 13 minutes held a filibuster against the civil rights legislation. Senator Robert Byrd used the uh, uh, nigger word three times on a national televised TV show. No outcry at all. Nobody said a thing, at least from the Democrat. No, the Black Caucus didn't say anything, the NAACP, no outcry. There's no price to pay when you're on the left and you make intemperate racial remarks, there's no price to pay. We say, well, it's just, we, we're making much to do about nothing. They wanted to destroy uh, Trent Lott. I mean, they went after him on BET, and this man had to eventually apologize, but nothing from uh, Senator Robert Byrd. Hypocrisy of liberals and media around how they reacted to Dodd's praise of Byrd on the Senate floor and the reaction of uh, Trent Lott praising an old man that was going to be dead within a year. Contrast that with the absolute silence of the liberal media around uh, Bob Byrd being praised. I mean, a Klansman, a Klan leader, not just a member of the Klan, not just influenced by the Klan, but a operational leader of the Klan. One of the things that has mystified me most over the last few years is to look at the civil rights establishment and have them uh, regard the news of Colin Powell uh, becoming America's first black Secretary of State, uh, Condi Rice becoming America's second black national security advisor. And not hear uh, some of them say, look, we have differences in opinion over their policies. We don't necessarily approve of everything they believe in, but this is a great step forward for Americans and black Americans in particular. What you hear instead is that, uh, well, they're tokens and uh, maybe they're wannabe whites and you have these awful cartoons, political cartoons that were done after, after Condi Rice was named Secretary of State where she was uh, sitting on a porch barefoot uh, looking like some kind of a welfare queen or something like that speaking in jive. Yet another one where she was a parrot sitting on George Bush's uh, shoulder with uh, big fat lips. I mean, just the most awful, hideous uh, racial stereotypes, anti-black stereotypes, uh, being hurled in the, f in the face of a very, very intelligent woman who was uh, a gr uh, Stanford University provost, speaks Russian, very accomplished woman from... ...to ascribe positive things to whiteness 
a negative thing to blackness. So the kid who goes to the library and who plays the piano, uh, the, the classics, um, who studies is acting white. What it says basically, the people who argue that way, is that we black people uh, don't have control over our own minds, we're not allowed to think what we wish, and we're essentially supposed to walk around in a racial plantation where everybody's liberal, everyone believes in the Democratic Party, and in that respect we're not really men and women, but sort of uh, like cattle. And so then they think, well, do I want to let my race down by acting white? Uh, do I want to betray my people by acting white? And they say, well, I guess not. I guess I'll act black and come to school unprepared, not participate, not speak in proper English, talk jive. And what happens? You see a young black child's mind close up like that, and the kid's scores go down. And what have you done? You've ruined an American citizen for life.